Recorded live at Podfest Berlin, supported by Wonder Tax. Tax returns made easy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Potluck Food Talks. Today we have a special live episode, live from Berlin. Berlin, make some noise. Woo! So this is our episode number 52, which means we we have a whole year behind us. And before we start, we wanted to tell a little bit the, the story of Potluck, uh, how it started. It actually started with just uh, a call with Xander, who is just entering the room. <laughs> and, and we were talking about what could we do to travel and eat for a living, like in the next five years or so. So he, he came up with the idea... Just the the day next, the logo was ready with a cheap logo site on the internet. And just the day afterwards, uh, we made our first episode, which was uh, the Spanish tortilla. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, kind of this really sort of uh, cowboyness of like spontaneous episodes kind of carried on throughout the whole of last year, you know, just trying to fit in episodes um, in, into our work schedule, you know. And that's basically what we're going to be doing today, you know, we're just kind of, uh, Eric's literally arrived fresh off the boat, uh, stranded in Munich for how long? I mean, all night. Yeah, like I had a three hour sleep. Uh, I lost my flight. I almost lost my voice this morning. So the- it doesn't always sound, it doesn't always sound as sexy, you know, it's like normally it's really high pitched. <laughs> <laughs> But not today. No, no, no. Uh, so and, and kind of like, like the idea was to talk about whatever food related topics that we could talk for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. In this case, it's going to be an hour uh, talking about sandwiches, things we like about sandwiches or sandwich experiences we've had so far. And since we started with the tortilla, the, the Spanish omelette of the first episode, we thought we might start also with with the Spanish omelette of the first sandwich. Wait a second. One second. Yeah, an issue, technical issue here, just to... Oh, damn, we really should have checked that, huh? <laughs> Instead of drinking coffee. <laughs> It's not working, man. Why is it not working? Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, then we might just click. <laughs> uh, okay, what's the deal with... Tortilla sandwiches. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, we talked about tortilla in one of our episodes and tortilla is such a quintessential Spanish food. You know, it's like you find it everywhere. You find it in, you know, most sort of like pincho and tapas bars. And, um, you know, one of the like most sort of like easy, convenient, comfortable foods to go to in Spain is just like having a tortilla, um, putting it in a slice of bread, because that's basically, you know, I mean, the quintessence of a sandwich is that you have a vessel that you can put food in so that you can take it on the go, right? I mean, you could take a piece of tortilla, just bare hand, I guess, you know, but, uh, you know, a piece of bread is just kind of convenient. And this is something you will find like in school cafeterias and all kinds of uh, like on a train station everywhere. It's like like really a, a staple in, in Spain. Yeah. And it's kind of like, you know, like why sandwich, like an interesting topic, you know, it's kind of like it's one of those things where you can go really in depth of uh, why it's um, interesting because it's something that you find literally everywhere in the world. It doesn't matter what food culture you go to. You always have a certain sort of type of sandwich where you have this like aspect of convenience and on the go and sort of like everyday nutrition. I mean, here we have the good old carbon carb, carbon carbon protein, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that, that's what, what I was going to say. Like, like putting potatoes on a sandwich is kind of counterintuitive. But do you see that... Uh, Like in Latin America, you see a lot of sandwiches with fries or these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, double carb is, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so an- another one is like, uh, have you ever seen a picture of the first burger? Uh, because that's also a sandwich and it's probably the most popular sandwich in the world. So it, it didn't look at all like the burgers we know today. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, but then it kind of like we get to the question sort of like what makes a sandwich a sandwich, right? It's sort of like at what point is a sandwich a sandwich and at what point isn't it? Is it the bread? Is it just the fact that you can like take it in your hand, just eat it on the go? Like, Yeah, that's something we, we can discuss. Uh, that I have some slides to, to talk about that. Um, about the, the first burger, I, I wanted to mention like uh, it has nothing to do with Hamburg. Uh, at some point uh, in the States, they started making what they called, 
called hamburger steak, which is basically a bulette. And someone came up with the idea of making the sandwiches and that they're doing it uh, just like the original one still today. So you can have the original burger, uh, which was with a square bread and, and a real thick patty, nothing to do with the burgers we know today. Well, it's called a patty melt, no? Like if you do it like that. I think, uh, well, I don't know. I, I think patty is in, in the UK and, and the burger, you, the patty, you will call it burger. Just No, but there is a t type of sandwich where they make it exactly like that, which is called a patty melt. Okay. It's, it's specifically like that. It was sort of like toasted milk bread and then like really sort of like smash burgery with like very limited, because like burgers are often so overloaded, you know, and the patty melt is just kind of like, Smashed meat, cheese, onion, and like maybe some pickles and stuff on like toast. Yeah. It's funny because uh, then you, you're like adding a, a new name for the original one, which is strange, you know. Same like with tomatoes. Tomatoes are tomatoes all around the world, except Mexico, which is jitomate. And that's the original world. Uh, the original word, sorry. So the rest of the people are just too lazy to add the uh, I guess, or, uh, yeah, yeah. Or it was lost in translation somehow. Yeah. So the, the word sandwich comes from a, a nobleman from the 18th century. Uh, he was playing a card game and he asked to get like a, a steak between two breads. And I mean, and he, he thought he was a genius. He was the first one in history to come up with that, uh, which probably is not the case. But the name stuck and that's that's why all sandwiches are called sandwiches. Of course. I mean, look at him, you know, he's like, <laughs> he's, he's like this uh, aristocratic white guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I've got this amazing idea nobody's done before. Let's just name it after myself. Right? Exactly. He's really proud of himself. Like many, many things, uh, like in the Western culture. Um, so let, let, let's break it into parts. Uh, let, do you have like a favorite bread for sandwiches in general or, or is it case dependent? I think, um, I don't know, like there's this whole... Um, discussion of sort of like, you know, sourdough, not sourdough. There was this whole sourdough like rave um, and I feel like loads of people started making like grilled cheese sandwiches and that sort of stuff with like this kind of country style sourdough but I actually think that for sandwiches like moving away from this like artisanal bread is actually better you know not to talk about things like I don't know bimbo bread you know but like uh, I don't know if you guys know the brand bimbo bread you know people from <laughs> Latin America and Spain and stuff they will definitely know this but this is like it's like a brand of like super soft artificial white bread um, and it's like delicious. It's sweet. It's soft, you know, and it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't want to chew, chew, like I like sourdough, but I don't want a chewy piece of sourdough for grilled cheese sandwich. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, like for sandwiches, the, the most gourmet thing I would come off is like a good brioche, which is like a very buttery bread. Uh, it has no water, instead only eggs. It's actually kind of complicated bread to, to uh, especially in the kneading process. It has so much butter that you have to add it by parts as, as when you do a mayonnaise. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of like a sophisticated technique to, to pull it off. And I think that's the most elevated thing I, I would use for a sandwich, even also for a burger or, or different kinds of sandwiches. Yeah, I mean, like the thing with brioche is that it's like very enriched. It's like an enriched bread, which means that you add loads of butter, you add loads of egg. Um, and milk and all that sort of stuff. There's like two versions that I actually prefer. Like there's a thing called Hokkaido milk bread, which is like less rich, but by the way that it's made, it's often made with, um, um, in German, we would call it Kochstück, which is basically like flour that is cooked. So like the gelatin in the flour, um, you cook it, the gelatin activates, you cool it down. Um, and um, when you add it into a dough, it's, modifies the dough you add more moisture which um, makes the crumb a lot softer and a lot more spongy there's also um, a really nice chinese recipe it's called tang tang zhao tang zhu something like that where you do exactly that you basically just make a slurry out of uh, flour and water let it cool down and then mix it into your dough and it makes the whole thing like super fluffy super soft and um, you don't have to add like so much butter or like oil or something like that to make the bread soft. That's actually, for me, that's like my favorite. Yeah. Like a, a good sandwich bread I like, and I found it out just out of an accident. Uh, a restaurant we were working together, I had like a baguette in my prep. So, and I had some surplus dough. So I just put it in a, in a baking form and I let it like overproof until it was really, really fluffy, mo much more than you would do with a baguette. And that is already like a super good sandwich bread. You know, it's like an easy hack to get, to get like a, a bread that you can cut and use for, for 
the typical, you know, square sandwich mm. and much better than, uh, you know, the ones you, you buy in the supermarket. Yeah, for sure. What about condiments, sauces? Do you have any favorites, any, any musts uh, that you would add to a sandwich? No, not really. I mean, it's just like such an infinite sort of world of like, you know, possibilities. I mean, it can be anything. That's kind of the thing, you know, it's like you go from like, culture to culture to culture and you'll find like just the most like the you know super super different things um i don't know like because i'm from central europe you know i feel like butter is you know kind of quintessential i feel like when somebody makes like a piece of toast and they make a sandwich they use something like olive oil it just kind of makes me it makes me cringe you know yeah i agree <laughs> i agree there are things where where olive oil is better even some sandwiches but yeah butter is is like the protagonist here i would also say mayo or mustard not ketchup ketchup is not my favorite uh, except for a burger but like ketchup is a very controversial topic you know? <laughs> yeah. let's give it to mayo and, and mustard mayo but, is like i don't know why mayo became this like um this like also quintessential sandwich component you know because like i mean you know more, more about you want to quickly delve into the history of mayonnaise because kind of yeah i can yeah. quickly explain it so uh actually the the word comes from an island in the balearic islands it's called maon and this island was conquered by the french and they were actually looking for the they found they were cooking alioli uh, which is uh, the the predecessor of mayonnaise it's not that someone added garlic to mayonnaise it's that someone took garlic out of alioli to make mayonnaise So the the French brought it to France, and at some point, the S Spanish imported it back to Spain, and so that's that's the reason why in Sp in Spain a lot of people say mayonesa instead of mayonesa, uh, but they like it got like translated back into Spanish the way the French were saying it mayonnaise into mayonesa, and yeah, that's that's kind of the story behind it. The French they the French fucked it up. You mean yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Uh, do you have any favorite mayo? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, like, uh, QP mayo obviously is very nice. You know, it's, uh, you know, if you add MSG to something, it always makes it like a little bit Yeah, nicer, but it also has know? like, <laughs> it also has like uh, Japanese mustard and some other ingredients. Does it? Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. I feel like maybe they just like add a little bit so they can put more on the ingredient list to like take away from the MSG component, you know, because that's really what makes it tasty. You know? Yeah, whatever whatever has a a, a kid cartoon on its label and it's from Asia, it has MSG for sure. I mean, can we talk about that? Why is there a baby on the on the mayonnaise bottle? You know, I think that's really misleading. Yeah, but there is another one. It's called Healthy Boy Brand. You know that yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also like this high MSG sauces. Yeah, but he's a healthy boy. You know, he's chubby. He's like, it's like, you know, it's like what the yellow bean curd thing, right? The yellow, the fermented yellow bean sauce. That's healthy boy, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I are, mean, I love that shit. But... Beans are healthy, you know. I mean, <laughs> what about mustard? I mean, we're in the land of mustard, you know. Um, mustard, mustard is cool, man. Like, I feel like people really like mustard is really underrated. Uh, here, like we have more of a culture, like in Germany of mustard, you know, you can go to a supermarket and you can buy, um, 20 different types. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. In like different strengths, etc. Like I got really cross one time when I was in, living in the UK and I was doing a catering and the uh, whole Brit British mustard is horrible. I wouldn't say that. I, w <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. Coleman's mustard definitely has its place, I think. Um, but like. I remember the host of the catering, she was sort of like, oh yeah, like blah, 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 mustard. She was like, nice and spicy mustard, not like your German mustard. And I was like, <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> I got seriously offended because I was like, man, you go to any supermarket team, you have like tons of mustard, you know? And like, also like really like here and in Belgium and in France, you have these like old mustard mills that still ferment the mustard, like properly, like different chunkiness, you know? There's like stuff like blackberry mustard and like uh, blueberry mustard, which is super delicious. Yeah, I've also seen one with figs or this kind of thing, dried figs and the mustard or yeah. black olives. Uh, yeah, the, 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 there are uh, different fruits. Super nice. Uh, I recently saw uh, like uh, a headline in, in the New York Times, uh, which I thought it was really funny. It said something about there's a scarcity of Dijon mustard in Colombia. And it says it would leave the eaters a tangy void in their hearts and sandwiches. Yeah, I mean, you know, that they, they must be passionate about the mustard, man. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever felt a tangy void in my heart. I mean, not mustard related anyway. <laughs> might be, might be. Uh, what about the veggies? Do you have any preference on vegetables for your sandwich? 
No, not really. I mean, like when I think of vegetables, I think more of pickles. Like I think pickles are really like a, they're kind of quintessential to sandwiches, you know. But like veggies, that's kind of like a seasonal thing, you know. Like whatever, whatever is around. Um, I yeah. don't. I don't generally like the sandwiches that are like overloaded with vegetables, you know. Instead of like you know, unless it's, there's like a purpose, like a BLT, you know. BLT for me is like one of the nicest sandwiches ever, and like the best BLTs, like often they're like overloaded with bacon. But if you have really nice like hurled tomatoes and really, really delicious lettuce and then mayo, super quintessential in a BLT and then a layer of like crispy, really, really crispy bacon. Um, I mean, that's one of the best sandwiches ever. You know? Yeah, I agree. I think it's something that shouldn't be abused. Uh, the sandwiches where, yeah, with a whole salad is like too much and you want just like a, a fresh touch, even if you're using something really dominant like a rocket, uh, you just want to put a few leaves, not, not like a... A big bunch that, that takes the whole thing. Yeah. But then again, I also feel like, you know, people often feel compelled, like they have to add something. Like they're sort of like, they look at a sandwich and they're sort of like, man, should I add some lettuce? You know, I feel like that there's like lettuce leaf that's peeking out on the side is missing. But sometimes you also have to just kind of be brave enough to just leave the lettuce out, you know, just let the sandwich be. Like not every sandwich needs, you know, needs like a handful of vegetables in there. And what about cooked vegetables or roasted vegetables? Yeah, super nice. I mean, like right now, I don't know, like, I don't know what you guys are thinking, but it's sort of like the sandwiches that we're talking about. We're kind of thinking about like slices of bread with like filling inside. But I mean, like, there's like loads of other sandwiches, like think of a pita bread, you know, a pita bread filled with like roasted vegetables is like one of the most delicious things ever. Yeah, I really like this uh, escalivada, which is this kind of roasted ratatouille from, from Catalonia. And that on, on a loaf of bread, that's that's the sandwich. Maybe some very high quality anchovies on top of that. And that's it. That is amazing. Yeah, super nice. So, and you mentioned pickles. Do you have any favorite pickles or, or recommendations around pickles? Well, I mean, the OG of pickles is the pickle, right? That's why it's called sure. a pickle. <laughs> no, like otherwise it'd be called, you know, pickled cucumber, but it's called pickle for a reason, right? Um, yeah, man. I mean, pickles... It's also one of these things that, like, I feel like people have kind of forgotten what a good pickle is because you just you just used to these like shitty supermarket pickles, but like a good pickle, like whether it's pickled or it's fermented or it's like brined, like brined, uh, pickle cucumbers are amazing. You know, when they're like properly properly brined with like a bit of dill and coriander seeds and stuff, they're super delicious. So I mean, that's I think that is the most important pickle. I think the the best I've had were were in, in America. I will get that to that later. Um, but also like, like uh, easy things are like jalapenos or yeah. uh, maybe uh, just marinating uh, onions in uh, brine or or in vinegar and, and you know that like really simple things to, to to add it to the next level. Yeah, I think like like Jewish cooking culture has a lot of really amazing uh, pickle recipes like. Um, actually that was one of the like best pickles that I tried also. And it's also this like beetroot pickle with like loads of grated horseradish that is kind of, kind of like, it's more like a relish really that you cook it down, um, with like a little bit of cream fresh and then you like keep it as like a pickle. Uh, it's more like a condiment, I guess. And that, that's super delicious. Like with like some smoked fish, you know, it's amazing because it's like super, you have the beetroot, the sweetness, you cut it with vinegar and then you have the spiciness from the horseradish. That's super, super nice. One of my favorites is also, like, have you ever tried, like, um, green tomatoes? They're more like a thing in the U.S., but... Uh, or in Mexico, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, like, never really pickled, I think. But, like, my, like I've tried them fermented, and they're amazing, you know? Often they need to stand for, like, a year. But once they're done and they're kind of, like, fermented through, they're so, like, fruity and tart, and they've got a super delicious, like, soft, um, but, like still like vegetably texture. They're super tasty. I haven't had, had them like that. I had some in New Orleans, like uh, green fried tomatoes, like, like the movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that, that's like a completely different thing. Yeah. Uh, what about spreads? Do you, do you add spreads to your, to your sandwich? Yeah, pretty much always. I feel like a dry sandwich is just sad, you know? Like it's, you know, it's... There's only so much butter that you can add until it's like not dry anymore. Yeah, um, like cream cheese or avocado, these kind of things. Yeah, all of that. Pesto, you know, like, um, I mean, like the biggest one that I can think of is hummus, you know. Ah, yeah, for like, sure. Yeah, like a like a pita bread sandwich, you know, with like hummus, tahini, something like that is, you know, like without that, it would just, it was, it would just be crap, you know, it was, it would just not be nice. Like it's, it's just as important as... Like for me, it's just as important as like the bread or the filling. 
We we haven't talked about sweet sandwiches. I'm not a big fan of like Nutella, peanut butter, of these, these kind of things, or marmalades. Uh, what about you? I am. Yeah. I, am. <laughs> I have I have some guilty pleasures with sweet, sweet okay. sandwiches. Okay. Go yeah. on, go on. Talk about it. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of PB and J sandwiches. You know, like because it's just a winning combination. What's that? I like, like the peanut butter and and, and marmalade and jelly. Yeah. Okay. Peanut butter jelly. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 But if you have like a nice sort of like like crunchy peanut butter with like a nice like salt component you know like super nice and roasty uh but the salt is really quintessential then you have like a nice jam like that's amazing and i mean you talked about nutella it's um like i used to make uh, nutella at home myself you know just like out of roasted hazelnuts which sounds super fancy is something that you would do in covid lockdown i guess but uh <laughs> Um, you should try it. It's really, really nice. Also needs like a really good amount of sea salt to be nice. But if you take that, and this is, I mean, this is a little bit trashy, but like you take like just shitty white bread, you add Nutella and then you add slices of banana and then you put it into a, then you put it into a sandwich press. You know, the ones that like divide your sandwiches into little triangles. That's just like, that's just, that shouldn't be allowed, you know, because you're <laughs> like, you no, I can't I can bring it. Fuck you up, I, I you can know? bring it a step further. You know David de Jorge, the, the Basque chef, like that super fat one who was uh, Martin Berasategui's head chef for a while. No. Well he he's like this TV personality. He he's also known as Robin Food in Spain. Oh that's that's terrible. <laughs> well and he, he had this uh, this special book uh, called Guarindongadas or something like that like that, like, like okay. really nasty bites. Yeah. And one was Nutella with chistorra, which is kind of like oh, a no. grilled cherries. <laughs> oh my god, that's that's really sacrilegious. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't stand behind that. So, uh, what about sausages, cold cuts, apart from chistorra without Nutella, for instance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, um, again, it's like it goes hand in hand. No, like I mean, I grew up like I grew up in Spain, so it's. Um, and especially like where I grew up in the Canary Islands, we had um, these type of bocadillos, which are basically sandwiches, um, but that were made in like a, like a very particular kind of way. I think actually like now understanding it more, it like comes from the Venice, like from the Latin influence of like Cubanos and stuff, where sandwiches are like really pressed like on a plancha, so really like planchado and kind mm -hmm. of like squished, super crispy on the outside. And there it's like you know, I mean. Uh, this is called uh, pyjama or something like that? Mm, I don't know. I mean, for me, they were just bocadillos. Okay. Yeah. And and do you use this bread called mollete that is very typical from the south of Spain? No. I mean, we like they would just use like normal, like the usual like okay. white bread. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. Like softer kind of baguette. Yeah, but going back to, to cold cuts, uh, I think Europe, all over Europe, if you go to any country in every different region, they have their, their own different types of sausages or you know like charcuterie it's like a like a really rich culture in general if we talk about germany or france or spain you know completely different things it italy as well yeah of course but i guess it's like it goes like it makes sense you know because like you have something that is like processed for you to keep right so like that's what sausages kind of like are for is like to preserve meat so like all the stuff that you don't eat, you make in the sausage so they keep longer. And then you like, you know, if you pack something for on the way, like if you're like, I don't know, shepherding or whatever you do in the dark ages. Um, <laughs> I guess people still shepherd, you know, but uh, um, like, you know, you would take something that can keep, you know, so like you would put some stuff in the bread, you know, cheese is the same thing. I mean, it's just kind of, you know, it's just milk that you don't want to go to waste, you know, yeah, sure. and then just you just find a way to work around that and then like necessity becomes a technique and the technique gets refined and refined and it becomes part of the the food identity and therefore the cultural identity. I mean, I, I'm a super, since you mentioned cheese, I'm a super cheese lover, but I don't get too complicated when it comes to sandwiches. Mm. Like a super good cheese, I actually want to eat it almost without bread, you know, uh, like a stinky French cheese that reminds you of your nasty sockets, you know. But <laughs> but for a sandwich, I just want like something you buy in the supermarket. What do you mean, like like American craft cheese or like what? Mm, yeah, like I don't know. These ones are, that are come already pre-sliced. Uh, I really like in Spain. You get a lot of uh, goat cheese uh, in that format, and that's what you want for for a sandwich or or even a, a, a high quality Emmental or something like that 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 you slice yourself. But uh, I don't. I wouldn't use like a, for instance. I don't know, like a sticky. 
a stinky camembert or something like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like Spain does have like a really good selection of sliced cheeses. Like, especially, I mean, if we talk about like cheese sandwiches, we have to talk about grilled cheese sandwiches. Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy how people get a grilled cheese sandwich like super wrong. I feel like it's just, it's just like bread and cheese, you know, but like <laughs> it's never really good, right? Like, do you do you make real cheese at home or? Um, not so much. But, no. Um, I mean, I used to do one when I was a kid, but uh, not, not lately. No, I don't know. I I don't anymore that much, but I went through a phase where I feel like I, I made one every day, and it's kind of like with a fried egg. It's like you people think that like frying an egg really nicely is really easy. You know, you just bang an egg into a pan, but it's actually not. You know, not at all. I mean, it's not. It is, but like if you're like weirdly obsessed with how things are cooked then it's not really you know because it's kind of like well the egg white cooks at a diff like at a different speed than the egg yolk and you don't want the egg yolk to be raw and you want it to be a little bit crispy on the bottom and you want the egg yolk to be just warm but like without Liquid. any gooey things like yeah. without any gooey egg white on the top it's kind of like that with the grilled cheese sandwich it's sort of like all right you want the outside to be really toasted you also want the heat to go to the very center of the sandwich so it's like melted through because like seriously there's nothing more sad than a grilled cheese sandwich that you cut into and then there's like a, a chunk of unmelted cheese in the center you know it's just super depressing <laughs> no <laughs> what a disappointment no <laughs> <laughs> uh it also came to my mind when, when you were in dubai you were doing a lot of sando sandwiches right uh, what's the deal with sando sandwiches um, I mean, sando is basically like just the, the like um, word that they use in Japan for like a sandwich. No, I mean, for these type of sandwiches. And again, there's sort of like, it's this Hokkaido milk bread. It's like very soft, squishy bread. And it got like very popular over the last couple of years, especially with like these um, katsu cutlets. I mean, either sort of like uh, these pork cutlets that are breaded and fried. Um and then it's, it's also very simple. It's usually like uh, served with this like bulldog sauce um, that you can buy in any like Asian supermarket. But um, traditionally it's made out of like onions and apples uh, that are cooked down and caramelized for a really, really long time. So it's kind of like a barbecue sauce, um, sort of like sweet and tangy. Um, and yeah, they become super popular. I mean, also because, you know, they just look cool. Like you cut them, you cut the crust off, you cut them into these perfect like rectangles. They just look like visually really striking, especially if you have like a piece of Wagyu that's like perfectly cooked. Um, there's loads of places like opening up these last years that just do Casa Sandos. Yeah, yeah, it's becoming a thing, right? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and This is also the bread you were mentioning that uh, has a little bit of milk, but it's also like a sandwich bread. Yeah, it has some milk, but then it has some milk powder in it also. And I mean, there's different ways of making it, you know. I mean, like the Hokkaido milk bread recipes that I use, like the, you take, you divide the dough and you roll it up like individually, sort of like you stretch it out, you roll it up one way and you then you flip it 90 degrees and you do the same thing. And what you then get is like this tall brioche looking loaf. But um, when you cut into it uh, and you look at the crumb, you can basically like pull the crumb apart in these like long feathery stripes. I don't know if you've any, ever seen anything like that, but it's got this really, really lovely texture. And that's because, you know, you create the gluten and then you layer the gluten in a certain way and then you let it prove up and it kind of bakes into it, into itself. Um, but any sort of like white bread. But like I wouldn't use brioche for that because it's too sweet yeah. and too rich. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. yeah like, like a regular sandwich bread or maybe yeah. a tramezzini or something like that. A what? Tramezzini? What's that? Like an Italian bread for sandwiches for paninis. Oh, I don't know. I don't know this bread. <laughs> Never heard of this bread. What's it like? Is it just like a white... Yeah, but I mean, just like, like, like what you mentioned. Just, I just know trapezzini, which is like these little pizza no, these, triangles. These, these ones are like super long, usually. Okay. But you know I mean, the pizza triangles that I'm talking about? No. This guy came up with them. He like baked, I think it, I think they're fried. Actually, he was making pizza fritta and he was making these like little shapes that he then like deep fried and he cuts one part of it off. And because the dough is so leavened, there's like a pocket and then he fills it with like meatballs and bolognese and stuff like that. Have you never seen that? No. It's like a big fast food thing in Italy. Like he's got like 20 locations and like, you know. But wh what about also the, this crazy trash food culture in the, in the States that they do like deep fried pizza inside a burger and the whole thing uh, battered again and fried again. You know, like there are these art books that are just focused on that. Yeah, I don't know when. No, you do know. You do know. <laughs> don't pretend you don't. 
I don't know. I remember I've, once I've we never... were in Buck and Break and, and your friend were showing us one one of these books with this ultra yeah. trashy food. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. I'm <laughs> I try I try to close my eyes and ignore that part of the world, you know. That's the the, the, the abyss of culinary creations, you know. <laughs> hey, that, but that brings me to that story. Like, um didn't you tell me the story about um your friend here in Berlin, who ah, was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are actually some witnesses here of that story. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, well, this was uh, in Prenzlauer Berg. There was this, you know, these donor places that are a donor, and in front of it, you have a, like a pizza place, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And I have this friend that was he was in Berlin just for three days, and he was obsessed to have like, uh, like ask a, a margarita, and to have all the donor ingredients and to roll the margarita. And they were like, no, we, we, we can't do that. <laughs> so they, they called kind of like the owner who was at the pizzaiolo who was on the back. And he came out, okay, let's do it. He was like that, you know, like, <laughs> like really motivated. So they, they did the margarita, put all the ingredients on top. And then they said, we're not taking responsibility to roll it. So you have to do it yourself. And it was like a huge thing, man. It was really like, like you know, like a... Like the diameter of a soccer ball, like like really big, <laughs> and it took like I don't know, like we we had to eat, call someone to help us eat the whole thing because it was too much. Uh, you can't eat it, and you just leave it in the fridge, and you just slice slices of it like a deli ham, you know. <laughs> it's just like that's some real Frankenstein shit, yeah. you know. Right? Yeah, that's that, that's really funny. Yeah. So t tell us about the what what prepare what what was your uh, what's the sandwich you're offering today. Or... Uh, today, yeah, um, yeah. As we we're talking about sandwiches, uh, we thought we'd make some sandwiches, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, we've made uh, some fried chicken sandwiches, you know, because I mean that's uh, something that we really like to eat, you know. I mean, it's kind of like a craving. Um, they're going to be very simple. It's just like buttermilk marinated chicken. Um, with like a, a little bit of like an Asian sort of influence. There's like a Szechuan kind of togarashi sort of uh, seasoning and like a shizo ranch um, dressing. We've also got a vegetarian option, which is like a mapo, mapo tofu. Oh, look, hey, you've got it ready. Oh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not supposed to talk about the pictures. Um, <laughs> yeah, mapo tofu, which is like... <laughs> yeah, please, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Heard. Um, yeah, mapo tofu, which is like a Chinese tofu stew. It's um, basically tofu that you braise in a like Chinese bolognese, if you want to call it that, like with like ground pork. Uh, but today, like it's totally veggie. It's just marinated in this like spicy um, chili marinade, also crispy fried with the same uh, with the same garnish. Nice. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So you, you lived in Mexico for how long? One year, two years? Uh, almost two years. Yeah, okay. almost two years in Mexico City. What's the deal with tortas? Man, tortas. Um, yeah, tortas are sandwiches. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's what they are, you know. But tortas are these like monstrous sandwiches. Like, I mean, a torta in itself is basically just like, um, I mean, um, it's it's this kind of it's almost like a baguette, but it's like softer, and then it's filled with you know usually like deli meats. Um, you know, vegetables, onion, cheese, and that. But the thing in Mexico is that they take it to like another level um, where these, as you know, this often happens in Mexico when they just take things to the absolute extreme where these uh, sandwiches just uh, transform into these huge, ginormous monstrosities of sandwiches in the best way possible. I would you know? say all, all over Latin America and Venezuela, we, yeah. we have something similar with burgers. It's like... Who makes the biggest burger with multi ingredients yeah. competition? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I liked in Mexico is that, like, you have these places, they have then like 15 different types of uh, tortas that they make, and they all get like specific names. It's like, uh, I can't remember any of the tortas ones, but they had it for tacos as well, where uh, there was this one taco stand who called their tacos like a specific name all the time. And there was like one that I really liked, which is called uh, El Abogado, uh, which means the lawyer. And it was uh, a lot of tongue and just a little bit of brain, which was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like you know, one thing that I don't that I absolutely didn't get because I love tortas and they're sort of like I mean it's the kind of food that you you look at it and you're like oh fuck let's get a torta you know let's 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 just get a torta 
And then you always kind of like regret it afterwards because you <laughs> just destroyed. <laughs> but like what I really didn't get were the tortas uh, ahogadas. Have you ever tried one of those? No. No, no, I, I've never tried tortas. I, I haven't been in Mexico. So it's basically a torta, which, I mean, you can all imagine. It's just like big fucko sandwich. And then it's basically like soaked in a like a tomato and chili salsa until it's like completely soaked through. And then you obviously it gets wrapped up. You take it away and you open it. And it's basically like this sloppy, soaked up like bread and filling mess, um, which I'm sure is delicious, but like I never understood it. It's like taking a... It's like taking a, I guess people do do that now that I think of it, taking a hamburger and dipping it in gravy. Yeah. yeah people actually do that, no? Yeah, okay. Yeah, there, there is a, a Chicago sandwich where, where they do exactly that. Yeah. They, they yeah. dip the sandwich in the cooking juice. Yeah. And there, there is even a, like a, a position to eat that sandwich with your elbows in a certain position so you don't make a mess out of yourself. That sounds really culty. I don't know. <laughs> like it's... Uh, <laughs> I've never seen that. Um, but like, I mean, that I guess, like if you have like the dipping thing on the side and you dip it in, you eat it, like that makes sense to me. I would do that. But like, imagine taking the whole, like a whole burger and having like a bucket of gravy and just dunking the whole thing in and then wrapping it up. And it's like, all right, there you go. It is something like that. It is, it's really yeah. something like that. Yeah. What about the donuts here where, where they heat the bread with the directly with, to the spice? Like ah, the yeah. bread. Yeah, that's, I don't that's know. Like for me, that's like a sign <laughs> that you're at a good place. You know, it's like when they, when they do that, it's like, all right, they like, because they take care of it because they, they, they don't have to. And it makes sense. You know, all the fat stripping out. They're like, you know, just kind of like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I agree. hundred yeah. percent. So my, my favorite sandwich and I, I've, I've said many times that this would be like my last supper for sure. It's just like a good Iberico, just for ingredients, Iberico, good olive oil, good tomatoes and good bread. That's it. Super simple. And for me, it's also the best way to eat uh, like good ham, which by the way, we can discuss about oil. Maybe Italian might be better than Spanish, but ham, Spanish ham has just no competition. My opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely, that's true. Um, but this is the thing, like you know, uh, pantomaca is like one of the most delicious things ever. And for people who don't know, I mean, it's literally just um, a type of Spanish white bread. It's called um, pan cristal, which is like a baguette, but kind of like more yeah. open. Like the the crumb is more open, and it gets super super crispy. You toast it as a very con uh, Actually, we have to be careful. It's a really controversial topic garlic. for Spanish people, you know. Garlic or no garlic. Garlic or no garlic or like, you know, like just brushing the tomato, grating the tomato on the side. Because like, honestly, people say just brush the tomato on top. No, but also like uh, just uh, using a garlic clove yes. and just putting it just yeah. around. You just you know? scrape it on top. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you That's just it. scrape it on top, a little bit of like olive oil, and then you just, usually you cut a uh, tomato in half. You don't cut it from like... You don't cut it uh, vertically. You have to cut it horizontally. It's very, very important, actually. And uh, then you just brush the tomato over this crispy bread and it soaks up all the juices and you just add some sea salt, some olive oil, and that's it. But it's one of the most delicious things Amazing. ever. Yeah, and I yeah. think if people haven't tried it, like it's it sounds so weird. You take a crispy piece of bread, you rub some stuff on it, and then it's like tasty. Like it's, but it's so good. It makes me crazy when I see people having like a super good ham and adding mozzarella to it and pepper and yeah. different things. It's like no, <laughs> don't, 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 don't do it. Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, the other Spanish sandwiches. Have you tried sobrasada? Yeah, of course. It's amazing. You know. It's basically like, like a chorizo spread, right? Something like that. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. It's like a sausage, but then you open it, it's soft inside, and you just kind of like spread it on bread. I mean, it's it's insanely delicious. Yeah, yeah. and, and sobrasada with like a good cheese and caramelized onions. A, a super typical uh, combination is sobrasada with honey, actually. Just that's really nice, yeah, yeah. I mean, earlier we were talking about like with Nutella with Chistora. I mean, that's wrong. <laughs> like, no, it's not, man. Like, you have to open your mind, Phil. No, there's only so so much that I can... There's only so, so much space for my for my mind to open. Um, but yeah, sombrasada with honey and then a little bit of salt, you know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, but th there is also a dark side, you know? They, uh, like sombrasada comes also from the Balearic Islands and they have these things uh, called ensaimadas, which is, you know, like a sweet yeah. thing. There are ensaimadas with sobrasada and that... I don't get, you know, it's like putting <laughs> chorizo to your cinnamon rolls. I don't it's know. Like, I, I don't know. I can, I can kind of see it, to be honest with you. Like, I can kind of, I can kind of see it. it. Yeah, I can kind of see no, that. I mean, yeah. I tried it and I was like, I don't get this. And everybody was like, mmm, ensaymada with sobrasada. 
It's yeah. the best. You have to be really careful with these like sweet and savory combinations. Like yeah. they, it goes from sort of like, oh, that's really like quite smart to like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> get, get away from the sandwich. Really press. quickly. Yeah. yeah. And then, then also in, in San Sebastian, they have these mini sandwiches that are pinchos that are baguettes just the size of a biscuit with different combinations. Yeah. There's a famous one. It's called the completo, which is uh, tuna belly, uh, piparras, which is a local uh, pickled chili, mayo, and anchovies. And man, it's super nice. It's you know, just, I've never tried that actually. Yeah, it's called yeah. completo. And another one I really liked. It was like uh, they call it. How was it like? Morsi, cho, chori morsi, or something like that. It was half chorizo, half morcilla, mm. like a chorizo and black pudding. So it looked like a black chorizo. That was that was also really nice. What about cheap calamares sandwiches? Man, that's like quintessential. Like if you <laughs> like, it's, yeah, it's you know. I mean, what is that? You know, it's <laughs> you look at it as like it's just like a piece of bread with like fried calamari in it. But honestly, it's like I can't. Um, like you're out at a day at the beach, you know, you buy like a, when botellones used to still be a thing, you know? Yeah, for, for um, me, this is synonymous with beach or yeah. Madrid. Either or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, you buy a, you buy like a liter, one and a half liter bottles, whatever it is of San Miguel and you get a, um, a calamari sandwich with, with aioli. It has to be with aioli. Yeah. You know, that's best. amazing. One of the best things in life. Yeah. In, in Venezuela, we have uh, this typical pork sandwich that is called pernil. Um, it's one of one of my favorites, so it has a lot of, of pork. But I have a lot, like a really funny story when when I was in Bolivia, my my friend Diego Prado was visiting. Uh, he wanted he had some list of places to go, and there was this super legendary in in Bolivia. They call it sandwich de chola, uh, which is basically a pork leg sandwich. But the story with this one, there were two sisters, uh, like vendor spots in the street. And the the first one had like a long queue, people waiting to have the sandwich. So and it was like a really, really nice sandwich. We actually got to try them both because we were the, the last one in the first queue. So once it ended, everybody turned into the second one. one once the first one was sold out. So everybody w went to the first one first and the second. So we tried the first one. It was amazing. And the second one was not, not so amazing. Good, but not that crazy. Right. And then we heard the story that these two women were sisters that had like a fight and hadn't talked to each other like in 10 years. And they have been doing that for the last 10 years, like this sandwich beef in the middle of the street. Man, they must have the, they must have the best beef. I mean, <laughs> pun, pun intended. <laughs> uh, but like, imagine the tea behind of that, behind yeah, that, you know, it yeah. sounds like a telenovela. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Bolivian telenovela, Cholita telenovela. <laughs> what about... Nordic countries, small broad. Yeah, I mean, small broad also, it's like, it, there's like such a cool culture like behind it. I mean, honestly, Danish rye bread, one of my favorite breads ever. It's like, if it's made right, um, it's so delicious, you know? Um, it's, uh, I mean, super dense. It's like full of whole grain and full of seeds. And then basically, I mean, like that, that's the country of open-faced sandwiches, right? It's kind of like, like earlier, you know, we're talking about pan uh, tomaca and stuff like that. It's kind of like, is it a sandwich? You know, exactly. It's like, uh, it, well, they call it open face sandwich. Yeah, but this is something you eat with, with fork and knife, which is like against the rules of a sandwich. That's true. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, is it a sandwich? Mm, nah, but I mean, but like the con content wise, it's really interesting what, what it has. Yeah, because it, it always had some pickles, some cured meats or fish, uh, always a cream. But like they go crazy with it because like, especially nowadays where they kind of, yeah, because the Nordic countries are kind of a little bit dead, you know, um, in a certain, certain aspects like culinary wise, but like with, uh, like now it's obviously completely changed to the whole Nordic food movement and stuff. Not to say that there wasn't good food there, but like there was less of an attention on the, the Nordic countries. And um, then the whole Nordic food movement came along with, you know, the Noma people and all the people that kind of came out of that. And... Um, What's the guy called? Um, Klaus Meyer. Klaus Meyer, and um, and now people are really celebrating this like thing that they've had for hundreds of years, and they've kind of like make it more intricate. And now there's these like amazing smurbrot places um, where they 
get like creative but in a nice way with the toppings and they kind of like super fill it up you know with roast beef and you know super amazing house made pickles and horseradish and i mean the seafood scene uh, in the nordic countries is amazing obviously you know these like your shrimps that they have you know that you can just eat raw like just a little bit boiled and it's like i love it it's super nice i mean the next time like when i go to copenhagen it's definitely on my list to go to a really nice more place yeah, so. yeah. Now, now, now i feel like going to copenhagen yeah. um what about wraps are wraps sandwiches i would say these are these has have to be the predecessors of the sandwiches we know today before this british guy said oh i'm a genius <laughs> <laughs> Oh, was he British? Yeah. Uh, that, that or sh- that or Scottish, out, I don't yeah. know, like something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. I'm not so sure, to be honest with you. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, like like you said, that's a, kind of the cool thing about sandwiches, no? It's like that it's like, it's probably like when I eat like a like a falafel sort of pita bread, I kind of think like this is like one of the foods that's kind of remained relatively the same for like so long. And thinking of s- sort of like, you know, um, like a cultural identity and like food evolution throughout the years, you know, I think that's kind of amazing because it's kind of like, it's like so primal in a way. It's like bread cooked in like a hot oven over the fire, like a flatbread, you know, and then just like stuff on top that you eat. Um, but I don't know, is it a sandwich? I don't know. Yeah, yeah I actually agree on that one. I don't know. What about these things where, where you have like rice cakes or ramen to make a sandwich like grilled ramen <sighs> i don't know man <laughs> i don't know it's uh i guess so right like i guess so why not you know yeah no yeah. You, you don't seem convinced no i'm not <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not i'm trying to convince myself um it's a heresy right i don't know but i'm from a bread eating country you know <laughs> like um Yeah, like is sushi a sandwich, you know? It's like rice, it's like fish that's wrapped in rice. That, like, and I mean, the sushi like originated because of that. It's kind of like, right, so we have, um, have you guys ever seen like the, the original sushi that's like pressed, right? I mean, because the rice in sushi is vinegar, right? Which makes it, um, obviously vinegar makes things keep longer because it's antibacterial. And um, one of the like very first versions with, was with uh, mackerel that was very lightly brined. Um, and then... Uh, put into into a sort of um, rectangular box with rice and then pressed and then sliced, right? And then wrapped in seaweed so that you could take this. It would keep for a little bit longer um, and you could take it on the go and eat it, right? And that, again, is like an example, like with sandwiches, of sort of like a necessity that becomes like a, um, a trend in a way and then, you know, gets refined and refined, refined and becomes like part of the food culture, you know? Um, so you could kind of say that sushi is a sandwich. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, like it actually it makes sense. Like um, it's it's kind of like a structural thing talking about sandwiches. Yeah. What about croissants? Sandwich with croissants? Yeah, for sure. Cro- for sure, sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No doubt. Yeah, I agree. we don't think I so. Totally agree. Yeah. The, what's the best way for you to eat a croissant? Do you have like any <clears throat> preference? Yeah, I actually, I actually do. I have, I think if you have a nice croissant and it's like, if you have a nice croissant, just eat the, eat a fucking croissant, you know, like don't do, <laughs> don't do anything with it. But if it's like the day after and this croissant is a little bit stale, sliced open and then sort of like, you know, like whatever you want to put in. I really like this like Italian ham, this like cooked rosemary ham that has like this rosemary crust. It's like, it's yeah. not cured, it's the cooked one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and like a little bit of cheese and whatever you want to put in, like if you really want to, if you really want to go that way and want to put some rucola leaves in or whatever, you know, yeah, that sounds and really then, amazing. and then you put it on a plancha and you press it until it's really flat, you know, that's like, for me, that's the best thing. It's kind of like, it really like revives the, the croissant. It's got like enough butter in it to get like really crispy and hot. But like, you have to press it super, super flat, you know, and just like embrace the like, <laughs> the, the two dimensions like a, aspect of the sandwich you know like a, a croissant hack i learned not so long ago you know may, many of these toasters they have like like this uh, part on top of the toaster which is actually to toast croissants so the croissants don't get inside the toaster but uh, it gets enough heat to get completely crispy you know like a fresh baked croissant So you can regenerate like a, a croissant the next day really? instead of destroying it like you just were just describing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't croissant shame me, man. We all have we all have our we all have our moments, okay? Um, yeah, but that's cool. I've never tried that actually. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Yeah. 
Uh, do you toast your breads when you do sandwiches? Like, do you use a pan or, or do you prefer like a toaster? It really depends. I mean, like if I'm just making like a like a filled um, sandwich, I, I toast them. But like I, most of the time I fill it in a way where I want the cheese to melt. So I usually always build a sandwich and then do it in a pan. Uh, like I would with the grilled cheese. You okay, know? I actually uh, like like uh, toasting toasting the the bread before, like with lots of butter on both sides, or yeah. or on a toaster, yeah, whatever. But like, I mean, like I, I I think the winner is like the panini grill. You know, like a panini grill is such an amazing piece of equipment. I think it's one of the most underrated pieces of equipment ever. Um, I like when I was still like a much younger chef. Like I did a pop up in London and in this really. A uh, raggedy small kitchen, and we didn't have any equipment apart from like an induction and a panini grill. And the amount of things that you can find that you can do in a panini grill is absolutely ah, yeah, amazing. For sure. no, you can seriously. do anything. In yeah, a panini really. Grill. Yeah. It's like no, absolutely. I think it's one of the most underrated pieces of equipment ever. You know, from like grilling spring onions with like these beautiful like char marks and uh, I'm sure searing you can meats do even a, and uh, like a pan bread on a panini grill. Yeah, like the bread itself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, have you ever seen that, like professional? Do, do you toast your buns when you're doing a burger? Yeah, hundred percent. With with a regular toaster or how? No, on a on a griddle usually. Because that's some, also something like I learned. I use like a regular toaster, and and I learned that burger places like McDonald's they have like these super sophisticated toasters where where you get a bun toasted like in five seconds mm. uh, on both sides. And that I, I was working on a project for for a burger company, and I learned this, and since then. I always use like a, a regular toaster and it works out super well. A regular toaster for burger buns? Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, do you have any like memorable sandwich you, you ever tried somewhere that, that you want to talk about? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I um, there's this place in London called Dusty Knuckle Bakery. Okay. And uh, they do like... Um, regularly changing sandwiches and they're just like super, I mean, they're like not like crazy naughty or anything, but it's exactly like what you want. It's like a nice spreads, like roasted vegetables, really good deli meat, like really nice cheese and stuff. And then they, they bake all the bread themselves. So it's like, it's super nice. And they're just like, and they'll do the sort of like, you know, roasted squash with like hazelnut pesto and goat's cheese, you know? And it's like, oh my God, so nice, you know? Um, just kind of like really like with a, like a chef's perspective, you know, they were like really nice combinations, um, like simple ingredient focus, but like super interesting and just super, super delicious. For, for me, for sure, the best sandwich I've had in my life was uh, in, in Fiorenza in Italy, in Tuscany. It's this place called Alantico Vinato. And that, well, first of all, in most of Tuscany, all the breads are almost without salt. So it's, Kind of annoying, you know. You're in a restaurant, you have your bread, and it's, uh, it doesn't have salt. And yeah, it's, it's true. It's Tuscan yeah. bread. Oh, ah, yeah. nice. <laughs> nice, <laughs> like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> can have some salt. Yeah, exactly. But this one has, they, they do like this. It's not a focaccia. It's a different type of bread. Uh, but, you know, in terms of structure, it's kind of like a focaccia. Mm. And so it, many people, it's for, for a lot of food writers, it's the best sandwich place in the world. I had this one that they do like a, a local uh, salami. Uh, it has like a pecorino cream, uh, then also an artichoke cream and spicy aubergines. That's it. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, yeah, I mean, no. that, that's the genius of like Italian cooking in general. You know, it's it's just sort of like just super simple product focused. You know, it's just like not overloaded, um, seasonal. And then there's just the quality of like, because like what makes these sandwiches like so good? It's just like the pure quality of like, you know, if you just have like a mortadella, you know, um, just a super high quality mortadella. You don't really need anything anymore. In yeah. Mortadella, a little bit of olive oil, you know, that's it. Well, talking about mortadella, like uh, Anthony Bourdain's favorite sandwich is like a, 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 just a bun, grilled mortadella, uh, grilled cheese. So you grill like the mortadella on a pan as you would do with, you know, like with a steak or anything. That, that's in the States, that's called a fried bologna sandwich, <laughs> you know. That's, uh, yeah. And then it's just uh, mustard and mayonnaise. That's it. Yeah. Hey, that's uh, that's a winner, you know. Like, honestly, like, um, I like that, you know. it's um, I got that from an American friend of mine. <laughs> she was just like buying like store-bought like mortadella <laughs> in Spain. <laughs> just like put it in a pan. And I was like, what are you making? She's like, bologna. <laughs> 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 making bologna. 
Um, and it's really good, you know, with like a spicy mustard with it, you know, and then like if you add nice cheese, you know, super nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I think we, we've reached time to perhaps make questions. If someone in the audience wants to make a question before they do, we have to pass the mic. Do we have sandwich related questions or <laughs> just general <laughs> questions? I would like to know where is the this Alantico Vinayo, which which is the place in Italy where it is. Uh, it's in Firenze, Florence, and they have like, like six different shops in the city. Yeah, yeah. but they've actually just opened in the states also. Like they've just oh really? Yeah, like very recently. I, I didn't know. About I that. think like I think probably New York. Okay. Uh, yeah, and they've, because it was so they got so Instagram famous also. You know, with these like big like stacked up mortadella sandwiches that they, I think somebody reached out to them and offered them a lot of money. Yeah, be, because the sandwiches are like, like a plate size, you know, it's like, like, like a huge thing. They're huge, yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Uh, talking about grilled cheese, um, there used to be a place here in Berlin which was called Tin Man. They had an excellent grilled cheese, but unfortunately they closed. Where would you go for a good grilled cheese now? Oh, in, that's difficult. In, in Berlin. Uh, that's difficult, honestly. Um, I haven't had like a super standout grilled cheese um, here yet. Uh, the closest thing that I can think of is 44 Brecky in Friedrichshain. They do like an egg drop sandwiches with like melted cheese. And it's like, it's more like a brunch breakfast place. Um, and they're kind of like similar to that. They make really nice bread, like really nice milk bread. And it's these like very thick sandwiches with like egg drop, bacon and cheese. Um, and they're very nice. Like, they're very, very good. But grilled cheese, like a puristic grilled cheese, I, I don't know where you would go. No idea. Yeah. Not, in, not in Berlin, especially. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Because, <laughs> <laughs> Phil, you said that um, making a grilled cheese a sandwich is not really easy. So can you show everyone or tell everyone, you know, what they have to <laughs> take care of when they want to make a really good sandwich? I mean, I can't show anybody because I'd have to pantomime making a grilled <laughs> cheese. That would get awkward. But um, Yeah, so it's pretty simple. Like it's um, you choose your bread, you choose the cheese. Um, I would say... Like if you're a butter person, you lightly butter the inside of the bread, but then you build your sandwich and you butter the outside of the bread also. Just a very thin, even layer on all the bread. And then I usually start it in a cold pan, right? So I put the bread in the pan and I turn the heat onto medium and I wait until one side is like really nicely golden brown, but not all the way that I want it to be golden brown. And then I flip it and you also put some weight on it, right? You press it down can be another pan, can be a pot or, you know, like this. I mean, in professional kitchens, we have special weights that we use for when we're searing fish or anything so that it keeps it flat in, in uh, contact to the pan. And that really helps um, transmit the heat, um, but also keep the sandwich like really nice and flat and, and press it down and keep it together. And then once I have the other side browned sort of like 70% of the way, I flip it again, brown a little bit more, flip it again. Like that, you kind of extend the time that the, uh, the sandwich is in a in a pan, and by that time the cheese should be fully melted. Yeah. And then, if you want to go extra, depending on how fatty the cheese is and how much butter you you put on your bread, just give it a little dab on like a little bit of like a paper towel to just take the excess fat off, and then the bread will be super crispy. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Another one. Okay. So a uh, big round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, it's super nice to see, you know, all the friendly places. Uh, and since you're so cool people, everyone who came to the show is going to get a free sandwich. So um, it's getting prepared outside, and Chef Phil will, you know, put on his secret magic, and I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you so much. Yeah, maybe give us a couple of minutes to set up outside. Uh, I don't know what the situation is there, you know, but uh, yeah, we should be, it shouldn't take too long. As you're waiting, obviously you can look up for Potluck Food Talks on Spotify or anywhere you listen to your <laughs> podcasts. You know, give us, give us a follow, um, give us a five-star review and all the shebang. <laughs> all right, yeah, we're going to set up a little bit, so just feel free to get something to drink. Um, hang out a little bit and once the sandwiches 
are almost done. I'll let you know. And that's it for this week's episode of Potluck Food Talks. If you like what we're doing, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also find us on Instagram and TikTok as Potluck Food Talks. The show airs every Monday.